We're going to try to be uh, very uh, brave today. Brave is probably not the word, but we're going to try to uh, actually cover two prakim today since we only have today and next week to finish the Yona. So everyone who wasn't here, the first ones, um, you're going to have to trust us that we learned something, okay? Because now we're starting chapter one. It's all on YouTube. What? It's all on YouTube. It's all on YouTube, right? It's all, it's all on YouTube. Listen, let's, let's open Sefer Yo now. We're going to see inside today. We're going to read the book. And we have one more intro that we have to do. So we have one more intro. <clears throat> Yona is uh, usually in between Ovadia and Micha. So else, if you guys uh, want to open it up, find it between Ovadia and Micha, Sefer Yona. And if I remind you, we talked about the five different appearances of Yona throughout, uh, through Chazal's eyes and through the only other mention in Melachim. We talked about Yonah's love for his nation and his apprehension to, um, to say anything bad about them and hurt them in any way. We talked about different ways he may hurt them. We talked about Yonah's um, backdrop, if he, which tribe he's from, if he's from Asher or if he's from Zvulun. And we saw how those two elements are conflicting for him. We talked about Asher being the guard in the north who blocks the Israel from a foreign infiltration and from foreign influence and always wants to do good for Amisel and bring uh, bounty and, 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 and plenty to Amisel. That's the Asher side. We talked about Zvulun whose eyes are open to the world and how he's always going out bringing new and important and interesting things from the world back to Eretz Yisrael and he becomes a meeting place and not only that through his efforts of going out he influences the nations and they are just as, as Zvulun is intrigued by the nations the nations are intrigued by Zvulun and he causes them to come to Har right like we said in the, in the Pasuk right that Amim uh, Har Yikrao Right, Amim Har Yikrao, Sham is bechu Ziv Chet Tzedek. Talk about the Ziv Chet Tzedek that he 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 brings people to Eretz Yisrael. Zvulun is as a as a as a Shevet, and Yonah has all these things in him. And in other words, Yonah maybe and this I'm I'm taking taking another step further. The Book of Yonah, which we said is very strange in itself. Does everybody know the Book of Yonah? Do you know the Book of Yonah? Oh, you know the Book of Yonah? Not so much. But you guys, I hope, we're here when we learn the Khan. Okay, so you're going to have to believe me. You're going to have to trust me with what I say. The book of Yonah is really, um, if you look at it like from the bird's eye, maybe from the dove's eye, then you could uh, see, uh, that, was a, that was a pun, because his name is Yonah, and Yonah is dove, okay? But um, you, you could see how there's a lot to do with the nations. In other words, the whole book is to the nations. It's to Ninveh, and then you have the sailors, the whole book is Amisil doesn't appear in the book at all. Not even once. If you think about it for a minute. There are no Jews in the book except Yona. There are whales and there are worms and there's wind and there's sun and there's there's sailors and there are the people of Ninveh and there are their animals. There are no Jews in the book except Yona. Okay, the whole book, in a sense, is a meeting place with the heathen world. Ad Kedekach, we'll see in this chapter, that it's important for Chazal to say that on the boat that Yonah goes, there were representatives of all 70 nations. And that is a statement of Chazal. It says Yonah really is affecting everyone. He has a connection with everyone, with the whole world. And it's fascinating because Yonah, as we said in the Malbi brings and other brings, when they explained that Yonah wasn't willing to go bring the prophecy that Hashem told him to, to Ashur, to Ninveh, it's because he wants to defend Am Yisrael. 
So we have him on the one hand defending Am Yisrael, willing to risk his life for Am Yisrael. On the other hand, the whole book is his mingling with other nations. And I think maybe in the depth of this book, there is a sod here of Am Yisrael's dual mission in the world. Am Yisrael really has a dual mission in the world. I'm saying all this before, okay? This is before we go into the, the Pesukim themselves. Am Yisrael has a dual mission in the world. And, 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 and different people in Am Yisrael are connected to different parts of this mission. One of our missions is an internal mission. It's a mission to establish here a nation of priests. Mamlechet Kohanim Vigoi Kadosh. Kadosh means separate. We are trying to establish here something unique, something which can't be tainted in any way from outside forces, something which we want to do what we call a Tarat HaKodesh, that we want to only be pure and holy, and that is only from within the Torah and only from within our culture. And any effect from outside just, just uh, nullifies it and, imp and it's impure and it hurts what we're trying to establish here. And that's true. <laughs> Everything I said is true. On the other hand, there are great things out there. And not everything is in Amisa. And there are kohot and powers and, and uh, phenomena that are outside. That Amisa, with all its talents, with all our talents and all our abilities, is limited. And Dafka, when you go out to meet these other nations and these other people and these other events and theories and understandings and cultures, they add something and they put a new prism on things that wouldn't be able to be understood otherwise. And they meet people and these people come closer to Amisa. And those people also are Hashem's creations and they also praise Hashem. All the nations are the supposed to praise Hashem. And we're the other aspect of Amlechet Kwanim in Goy Kadosh, we're Amlechet Kwanim within the nations. But who are we a Kwanim for? For the nations. Like, like the Kwanim are Kwanim for the rest of Am Yisrael. So too is Am Yisrael a nation of priests. For who? <laughs> for the rest of the world. And there, and there, there's a very, very international, universal flavor to Am Yisrael. Dafka, we're looking to affect other people and have them see the greatness of Hashem. If it's not us, who's going to show them the greatness of Hashem? How are they going to know? So that's the universal side of Am Yisrael. And it's also true. And within Am Yisrael, as we talked about the tribes, and we talked about this a lot last, le last lesson, there are different people who are connected in the soul, in their source of their soul to different aspects that I just brought here. And Yona, it seems, and I think this is part of why Chazal emphasized it, Yona himself has both of these things inside of him, as we all do to a, a, some extent. We have both of these, these, these feelings, these understandings, these, uh, these uh, I would say, um, Shorashim, these roots of soul in us. Because they're both Kadosh. They're both really Hashem's plan. Some of us will go one way, some of us will go another way. And those great, 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 great holy uh, people somehow manage to do both. Most of us are limited. But there are some people who manage to go, get, but we stand on both, both sides. Anyway, let's uh, start learning Torah. Yeah. Okay, chapter one. We're going to try to do chapter one and chapter two together because really we said, as we said in the first lesson, there are two parts. There's take one and take two. Chapter one and chapter two are one story, and then it looks like almost a repetition in chapter three and chapter four. Very clearly, they're they're parallel to one another. We saw the the beginning, the same pasuk. We saw the storyline is pretty much the same storyline. Bigadol is the same thing. So there is it. But the first, so we're gonna today we'll do the first two chapters, and Bnei Neder Be'ezrat Hashem. Next Sunday we'll do the second two chapters. And there's so much to talk about about both of them, but since we're limited in our time and we want to finish it before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we're gonna shorten a little bit. If I allowed myself to, 
דניאל דניאל בן נינה. לעילוי נשמת דניאל בן נינה, התיאבון, ישר כוח, כל הברכות. ישר כוח, טוב. וידבר אדוני עליונה בן אמיתי לאמור. אמן. קום לך אל ננווה העיר הגדולה, וקרא אליה כי עלתה רעתם לפניי. Go to Nineveh and call the great call that, I, that I'm telling you and because their evil has come before me. Ve'yakom yonah livloach tashisha milifnei Adonai. Ve'yered yafo ve'imtza oniyah ba tarshish. Ve'yiten zchara ve'yered ba lavoi mehem tarshisha milifnei Adonai. Where is Yonah trying to run away to? Tarshish. Now, I would say if Yonah is trying to run away, so he'll run away. But it's clear that he's not running away, only running away from. He's not only running away from, he's running to. He's going to Tarshish. He's not going, right? Again, look at the words. It says Tarshish three times. Yonah gets up to run away to Tarshish from Hashem. And then he goes and he finds a, a, a boat coming from Tarshish. And then he wants to go Tarshisha. Okay, it's, in a, it's, it's very clear that Tarshish is a, is a major thing. So, so the, one, the, the, fir, the first two aspects we're going to have to talk about here is one is, what in the world is Yonah doing when he's running away? What does he think is going to happen? And why is he going to Tarshish, Dafka? Where is Tarshish? What is Tarshish? What do we know about Tarshish? We mentioned it really shortly when we started learning it, but we're going to have to go into that a little more. So, ואדוני הטיל רוח גדולה על הים, ויהי שר גדול בים, והאונייה חישבה להישבר. So our, our boat is in a big storm, and, the, and it's going to be destroyed. ויראו המלאכים, ויזעקו איש אל אלוהיו, ויטילו את הכלים אשר באונייה על הים, להקל מעליהם, ויונה ירד אל ירכתי הספינה, וישכב וירדם. So we talk about the... The sailors who start yelling out to their gods and start throwing their vessels, their, their kelim, their vessel, their vessels, I guess, into the ocean um, so that the boat won't sink. And Yonah goes down to sleep in the bottom of the boat. The, 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 the Rav Chover, the, the captain, comes to him and says, what are you, Why are you going to sleep? Right? call your God, maybe he, the God, Elohim, will, will, will uh, change his mind or will awaken and we won't be destroyed. I'm reading this quickly because we read it already. And you guys have the English as, as I'm following, so if you want to follow with me, it's, it's Baba in English. So the people on the boat, the, the sailors say, let's make uh, lots. We good? Yeah. So they start throwing lots to see who is responsible for this and the Goral falls on Yonah. Right, they start asking questions. What's going on? It's clearly Yonah is the story. We'll see how, just how clear Yonah was the story. It was clear to them before they throw the lots. But we'll, we'll also I'll explain it in a minute. Um, where are you from? What nation are you from? What's your story? Right, so he says to them, I am afraid of the, the God of the Shemaim who made the, 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 the land and the sea. And the people are very, very frightened. What have you done? Because they know that the people knew that he's running away from Hashem because he told him them. We'll talk about that pasuk too. What should we do for you? The, 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 the waters will be quiet because he got more and more. was getting worse and worse. Take me and throw me into the ocean. And the waters will be quiet. It's my fault that you have this great storm. People try to paddle back to the land, but they can't. We shouldn't be destroyed in the name for, for because of this uh, of this man. We don't want to be throwing. It's not, it's, it's a, a blood, right? It's a, 
uh, clean blood. We don't want to kill him. You, Hashem, can do whatever you want. So they take him, they throw him into the water. The storm immediately stops. The people are very scared of God or an awe, awe of Hashem. And they bring sacrifices and they vow, they take oaths. Tov. That's the end of chapter one. So, let's start uh, unpackaging pack chapter one. First of all, let's take the practical method and just understand. Yonah goes down and he goes to Yafo to run away from Hashem. Now, what does run away from Hashem mean? Talk about you can't run away from Hashem. So, the Barbanel and others here say, uh, the, the Malbim brings it, says there's a difference of running away from Hashem or from in front of Hashem. Mipnei Hashem and Milifnei Hashem. Mipnei Hashem is from Hashem. And Milifnei Hashem is from before Hashem. Says the Barbanel, he throws out an idea that what Yonah was trying to do is, Yonah is trying to run away, not from God, but from his, his job, from being a prophet. Milifnei Hashem means to run away from the, 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 the presence of God. The presence of God, Yonah says, if I run away from Eretz Yisrael, and I leave Eretz Yisrael, Hashem will not give me prophecy anymore. As we know, according to the Rabbi Yudha Levi in Sefer Kuzari, that prophecy is an inherent Eretz Yisraeli thing. It doesn't happen in Chutzar. It's, ah, I ask about Yechezkel and others who prophecy the outside Eretz Yisrael. It was all for Am Yisrael. In other words, when, 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 when the, the prophecies are about Eretz Yisrael, that also happens in Chutzar. But this prophecy was not for Eretz Yisrael. This was for Ninveh. Says Yonah, I will leave Eretz Yisrael and start having prophecy. Now, of course, that's a little naive also, yeah, if right? If he would go like, straight to Ninveh, like take a horse to Ninveh, would he be successful at his job, let's say? Meaning, why would he be successful in his like, job? If, if, the, if, the, if the prophecy was for Ninveh, right? Uh, could he go to Ninveh and told it there, or should he do it from El Sisrael itself? No, I think he has to go to Ninveh and, and do it there. Yeah, there was no option to stay so, in like, go, going out of Israel, wouldn't well, he got he got the prophecy in Israel. He gets yeah, the prophecy yeah, he gets in, Israel. The in Israel, and like going away from it outside of Israel would be like in any way he would do it. You're saying he was leaving Israel anyway, going to Ninveh also. Yeah, it's so like true. How 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 you escaping your your, your, yeah. your Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a good it's a good question. As you're saying, Bechol Mikre he was like going to have to leave and go outside Eretz Yisrael to do the job. Yeah. But it, it's a good point. He's going the other way, right? Ninveh yeah. is in the east. He's going west. He's leaving and going out into the ocean. Um, let's take a look at the Malbim. Where is Tarshish? Because let's take a look here for a minute. Uh, where is Tarshish? If you look at the back of your page that you just got now. She says Tarshish. The very, very bottom of the page. The very bottom of the last page. You see where it says Tarshish? Yes. So here are a couple of talking about Tarshish. I want to talk about Tarshish. Um, let's, well, as you brought it up, Shishan, we'll talk about this and we'll go back a, a second to go to another level of the Ifnashim. So, so um, what is Tarshish? So we have uh, we have uh, Melachim Aleph. You guys look at Melachim Aleph, Perak Yud, where it says, Ki onei Tarshish la Melech Bayam. Shlomo HaMelech has a fleet of Tarshish boats, okay, with Hiram, with the king of Tzidon. In other words, they're so expensive and they're so massive that he has it Bishutaf. He has it as a partnership with a with the great boat uh, the great boat uh, builders and the great uh, uh, seafarers from Sidon, from uh, from Hiram, who's, who's in the is in the north. Achat le shanim 
תבוא עונה תשיש נושאות זהב וכסף שנבים וקופים מתוקים. Once every three years these boats would return carrying gold and silver, ivory, monkeys and parakeets. Where does that sound like it's coming from? India. Or? Or Africa. They're coming from Africa. But not North Africa. Because there are no elephants in North Africa. Where are the elephants? They're in Central Africa. So we're talking about, I hope you have a map of the world in your, in your, in your head. These boats leave the Mediterranean, go around Africa, and there's no Suez Canal, go out the Mediterranean, go around the west coast of Africa, stop at maybe Ivory Coast, somewhere around there, go inland to Congo or to whatever those areas around there, come back all the way around, and that's why it takes. And that's why it takes three years. It takes three years. Or if they go down through the Red Sea, maybe around also. In other words, we're talking about it's, it's once every three years. Not only that, okay? If you look at Ishayahu Perek Samech, just to get another look at the, the. Actually, we just read this. Naf Torah. Yesterday. Mm-hmm. Look at Pasuk Tet. Perek Samech Pasuk Tet. Ki li iyi mi kavu vo'oniot tarshish barishona la'avi banaich mirachok kaspan ve'zava mitam. Who's going to bring your children from far, far away? The boats of Tarshish. You guys see it? In, uh, in uh, Ishayahu Samech Tet. Ishayahu, the, the, the prophet Ishayahu. 60, uh, chapter 69. It was Aftorah. We read yesterday, Bimikre. Nachon, Aftorah of Rashat Ki Tavo. Um, and they bring... So, uh, so, so, on Yot Tarshish, we also said it. We're going to say it tomorrow. Where are we going to say it tomorrow? We're going to mention Tarshish again. We're going to say it tomorrow. What do we say tomorrow? What's the Mizmor Shir Shal Yom of Monday? Mizmor, Tehillim. Anyone remember? Tehillim Memchet. Tehillim 48. We're going to say it tomorrow. Talks about the greatness of Yushalayim. And it says, Hashem's gonna come, and all the nations will shake. Beruach Kadim Tishaber Oniot Tarshish. With the great east wind, the great boats of Tarshish will break. In other words, the boats of Tarshish are massive boats. We're talking about the greatest, strongest biggest boats of the time that can handle the farthest journeys of known to Mesopotamian man at that moment, at that time. These are the boats of Tarshish. Why are they the boats of Tarshish? Tarshish is a far away place. And the boats of Tarshish have to be massive to be able to handle that. And who are the people who go on the boats of Tarshish? hardened sailors. Who goes on these boats? So when they're little sailing from uh, Yafo to Haifa, I could do it, maybe. But to go from Israel all the way around the coast of Africa and around and deal with the natives and get this thing, we're talking certain kinds of people. When Yonah comes to this boat, now, now, now let's make it even crazier. Yonah comes down. Who's Yonah? Yonah is a prophet. We know he's a prophet from before. He is a man of God. Because Hashem spoke to him. He comes to this boat and he says, I want to go with you to Tarshish. What do you think the people say? <laughs> Get out of here. Are you out of your mind? What is, what is this? On a, on a boat like this, you have not one iota of extra baggage. Right? You have to like pack everything in for this journey that takes three years. 
Remember Shlomo? Three years a journey. It's going to take three years. Now Chazal have a whole list of things that happen here. Chazal say, and they read, when they read Sefer Yonah, they go like this. He goes down to Yafo, and he finds a boat coming from Tarshish. It's coming from Tarshish. So, where is he located? So, wait, we're, it's in Yafo. It comes to Yafo. It's come to Yafo after three years. And what does Yonah do? Vaiten schara. He, at first it's how he pays for it. Chazal say he didn't pay for it. You know what he paid? He paid for the whole boat. He buys the boat. From here, Chazal learn that a prophet has to be wealthy. Here, from here they learn. How do you know a prophet's wealthy? From Yonah. Because it says, Vaiten schara. You know how much it costs to buy a boat of Tarshish? Well, we just talked about the boats of Tarshish. We're talking about something absolutely bizarre. He's willing to pay them enough money for sailors who just arrived to leave immediately and go. And not to take any other passengers, just go. What do you think the sailors thought about Yonah? Rich. They like him. <laughs> rich. Well, he's definitely rich. They like him? No. <laughs> no. They don't know. Like if someone comes in, I'll give you an example, right? Someone comes in to a car that you're driving and he says, pulls out a million dollars and says, take the million dollars, drive me to the airport. What do you think you're getting involved in right now? <laughs> Not Baru, right? Some, some big person's running after this guy. Something really dangerous is going on. Now these sailors are are danger-loving people. These are people who are fearless. But, whoa, this is ridiculous. They've never seen anything like this. This guy comes, and he doesn't look like your typical uh, that's mafioso. Why, that's why right? they know that something's wrong with you now, oh. and the storm comes up. No, no, no. So, so from the first minute Yona goes on the boat, it's very clear to yeah. them that this Yona character is not a normal person. He's not normal. And something big is chasing him. They just don't know how big the thing that's chasing him. That they'll find out when they start leaving the port. But at this point, they realize that something is very, very interesting going on. Very strange. Very weird. And, and, uh, and, and so in the shot of the book, just when you understand what Tershish is and what's going on here and, what's, what, and who, who, who are the characters here, we have these are like the dregs of society the dregs. These are like the most hardened, calloused men in the world. They're seafarers, sailors, they're known throughout the world, not as being the highest level uh, moral, uh, I don't know if anyone here is family members who are sailors, I'm sorry. But, uh, you know, sailors' names in the world are not the most uh, wholesome folk in the world. Till this day, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you have to be willing to leave your family for, for, for ages and you or live you or you don't have a family and you live. There's the law of the sea. The law of the sea is not the law of the land. It's different. So these are the characters and this guy comes on. He's, he's a holy man. I mean, the guy seems like some, something else. He's not their usual cup of tea. And he buys the boat or he pays for the whole voyage or whatever he does. He pays like a ridiculous amount and says, go. Just get up and go. Okay. And as soon as he goes, things start going wrong. Who do you think they're going to blame for this? <laughs> Who do you think the they're going to... The one that paid a million dollars. <laughs> of course. The weird person is on my boat. Not only that, what does he do when the storm starts? What does he do? He goes down to go to sleep. Have you ever tried to sleep on a boat? That's being thrown around in the waves? I've been sleeping in the boat, fishing boat, but it's, the wave is like crazy. It's like during the night as well. It's, is it e it's easy to do or not no. easy? If you're not a sailor, to sleep on a boat, no, I don't know, I don't know, because I'm not I'm like talking, Kilo, I know something. I don't really know anything. But what I've heard and what I've read, that if you are not a sailor and there's a storm, you are either frightened out of your wits and you're definitely not sleeping. You're probably throwing up all over the place. And you are scared out of your wits. And this guy, he goes down to sleep. So when the Rav Chovel, when the, when the captain comes to him, and he talks to him, 
he says, Vayakrev elav Rav Achover. He gets close to him, which already demands a certain element of, of uh, you see, he's like, he's hesitant. Vayakrev, he doesn't say the Rav Chovel, the, the, the captain. The captain has to be someone who controls these sailors. We're talking about like Mr. Tough Guy. Okay? He comes close to you and he doesn't even touch him. Right? He goes, why are you sleeping? Get up and call to your God. Right? Not a, not the harshest word. Not like, what did you do to us, you crazy person? Well, look what's happened. Call to your God. Maybe, maybe, right? Ulai tashet Elohim. Maybe God will save us and we won't be destroyed. Already you hear that they may, in their mind, have already started connecting that this guy did something so bad that God's after him. That God is after him. Already in his mind. Now, imagine their horror in finding out that God is really after him. Not in a roundabout way. Not in the way of, of uh, that he did something evil and Hashem is chasing him, but he flat out is running away from Hashem. So then, <laughs> this is the storyline happening here. But what you see here is an amazing, amazing thing. Yonah decides to go to Tarshish. He says, I am going to leave everything I believe in. I'm going to run away. I'm going to erase, in a sense, my love of my people. I'm going to be pretty much the farthest part of, human, of known human colonization. It's like, it's like going to Australia in the olden days, right? Like I'm going to leave everything for Amisa. This is his plan. I'm going to go as far away from... There's no, they didn't, America wasn't discovered yet, right? Everything else is over land. I'm going to go the farthest reach of, human, of known human geography so that Hashem cannot make me go to Ninveh and do what I have to do. I give up. I am not willing to do what Hashem wants me to, for whatever reason we talked about in the past. I'm not willing to do it, and I'm going to go to the extreme to do it. Now, the Malbim beautifully says like this. The Malbim, if you see, he, he, he's, he, he, he says that Yonah knew what was going on. And he does the difference between a Sfina and Onia. There's a difference between Sfina, right, there are two words for a boat, Sfina and Onia. He says the word Sfina comes from the, the part that's in the water, Safun. Okay, Safun is like down or uh, hidden. Like Safun, like we say in, in the Leila said there, the Safun, the hidden. So Safun is like hidden down. So he goes, says the Malbim, says like this, that he went down to the bottom. This is the last Malbim on the second page. Says Yonah was trying to commit suicide when he goes down to the bottom of the boat. Why? As he said, the water will come into the boat, the people on top will be saved, and I'll be drowned in the boat. And he goes on. <laughs> He says he was trying to save everybody, trying to save the people on the boat. That's why Yonah goes down, because he doesn't want them to die. He knows, Yonah knows, he's, 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 he's running away from God and for all the, whatever the consequences are, he's willing to take them. He's going to die. But really, here and here comes really the the hafta, the, hafta the, the surprise of the chapter. The surprise of the chapter is that suddenly, right in the middle of the chapter, Yonah stops being the story of the chapter. And you know who becomes the story of the chapter? The sailors. It's fascinating. In other words, Yonah 
at first, he's the story, right? But suddenly, the people who are active, the people who are talking, the people who are doing anything, are the sailors. Not only that, when they throw Yonah into the boat, into the water, the first thing, the, the water, everything stops, and then, instead of saying that the fish comes and eats Yonah, which is what we sort of expect to say, that, right, because Yonah's our story, right? If I have the storyline, they take Yonah, I'm watching a movie, okay? And they take him, and they throw him into the water. Falls in the water. The next scene should be, the next scene should be this big whale coming up and swallowing him. No, cut to the sailors. The sailors are on the, on the boat. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Hashem, you're great, Hashem. Not for Yonah, for the fact of the storm stopped. They are the story, not Yonah. What happens is that Yonah, running away from God, trying to not, um, not help the nations, not redeem the nations, unintentionally redeems the nations. <laughs> what he does is he unintentionally takes all these sailors and turns them into tzaddikim. The hardest, the worst, the dregs of humanity, the, of the, the, the 70 nations. Yonah, running away from God, turns them into tzaddikim. Ad kedekach, that some perushim say they eat geiru, they become gerim and come to Yushalayim and bring korbanot. Like it says the end, right? They bring korbanot. Where do they bring korbanot? Where do you bring a zevach la'ashem? Some of the person thinks in Yushalayim. Not only that, some people say, how did the people of Nineveh believe Yonah? You know why? Because the sailors came back. And they say, you're this guy? This guy, you better believe this guy because we have a story to tell you about what just happened to us. Okay? And they become the bearers of Yonah's deeds. They become the bearers and the, 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 the witnesses to the greatness of God. Yonah trying to defend Am Yisrael as a unique nation and their own nation and not vis-a-vis -vis the nations. He's doing what Hashem told him to do. Not to Ninveh, okay? Not to Ninveh yet. Yeah, that's going to happen soon. Yeah. But but and to the sailors. The stories. Now that Rabbi says that the They're the ones who went. Out. So not only that, it turns out, and according to this understanding, that Yonah's running away. It was what caused the people to believe him in the end of the day. In other words, there's no running away from Hashem. That's one major story here. There's no running away from Hashem. You will do your job, you the prophet, you the human, you the person, whatever you are, you will do your job. And there's no way out of that. Now that is an interesting statement because that isn't the Jewish way. That's like fate. That's like a Greek tragedy, right? Your fate is so-and-so and all the stories of the guy tries to do everything otherwise at the end of the day, da-da-da-da-da, boom, he f finds out Whatever his fate was, that's what happens to him. That's what many of the, the Greek thought processes are. Right? That's what's going to happen. We don't think that way. What do we believe in? Tshuva. Tshuva. The idea of tshuva. That there is not something decreed and that's what will happen. El Hashem says things to do. And we hopefully will do or don't do or whatever. But then we could fix it. We could change it. Like Xera Ninveh. It's going to be destroyed, but they do tshuva. And it's not. Ken. Why Yonah was not killed instantly by Hashem when he turned away from the Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So why was Yonah not killed? To, to, uh, to explain that, we're going to have to talk about um, chapter 2. Okay? Um... I just want to, I want to go back to the, to the sailors for a minute. If you look in the chapter, you see the sailors go through a progression of their fear. If you look at Pasuk, Pasuk uh, Hey, okay, verse 5 in, the, in chapter 1, you see, They are fearful. 
So what are they fearful of? The storm, right? They're, they're fearing the storm, like, like any normal person would be. As a storm, just an, as a side, Chazal say that the storm was only for their boat. All the other boats were fine. It was like calm seas, and they're going crazy up and down, up and down, and they see the other boats, and they're like, "What?" And you know, it's very clear that something absolutely supernatural is happening here. So they, so they're, they're afraid. So they call out to their gods. Okay, that's the first laugh. Then, if we go on, Pasuk Yud, Ve'iru anashim yiragdola. Then the people fear, a great fear. Okay? So here, here, I'll, I'll read you the Malbim. I'll, I'll read the Malbim. Kima shekatav t'chila ve'yu'u ha'malachim ha'yta yirat ha'sakanat. First, they were afraid of the danger. Aval yira zot ha'yta yirat ha'shem shi gdola lemalata lifnei lefi gdola ta'etzem shi yitaru mimenu. This second one is the yira of Hashem. And that's obviously greater because they were only afraid of danger and now they're afraid of Hashem. Okay. So, let's go on. He says, take me and throw me into the, the water. And they look, they try not to. They grew at Hashem in Pasuk Yudalid, at 14. They call out to Hashem, they say, Hashem, please let us not uh, be, uh, be judged or destroyed because of this man that we're killing. They throw him into the land, into the water, and look at Pasuk 16. So from Yir'ah to Yir'ah Gdola to Yir'ah Tashem, Yud Ke Vavke, they go through a, a, a progression of recognizing Hashem, getting closer and closer and closer to the awe inspiring of, of Hashem. And as Yonah is getting further and further from Hashem, throw, going down to the bottom of the boat, getting thrown into the water, sh- distancing him from Hashem, the Malachim are going in the opposite direction. They are getting closer and closer to Hashem. Yonah's running away, they're getting closer. So, even though Yonah's pulling one way, his effect on the, on the world is the other way. Because this is important to see in the, in the psuk. Okay. Let's go on to chapter bit, chapter two, okay? Chapter two is very short. Chapter two is the tefillah of Yonah, but it starts off like this. So Hashem calls a great fish to swallow Yonah, and Yonah is in the, the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And he calls out to Hashem from the stomach of the fish. Did I tell you guys the Midrash on the Dag and the Daga? There's a fascinating Midrash that Rashi brings here that says, at first it says he's in a Dag, and then it says he's in a Daga. What's a Daga? A female, a female fish. So, so it says like this, he was there for six days in the, in the thing. Three days in a fish and three days in a she fish. Why? What happened? When he was in the stomach of the he fish, of the male fish, he didn't pray. It was two good uh, conditions there. It was a five-star hotel. <laughs> so the he fish spits him out, and the she fish, who's pregnant with little fishies, brings him in. And there it's already tight. That's already like a one-star hotel. And there, Yonah, there he cries out to God. Now, of course, Chazal are not... That's why it says Dag and Daga. Now that it goes from Dag to Daga. Now, Chazal are not making children's stories here, right? They're obviously emphasizing a point. The point being, my goodness, when does this guy start davening? When would you guys start davening? Right when I get <laughs> I would say, right? Right when you see you're not dead, right? For the first, uh, after the first second that you're not dead, you're out there praying. It says, Yonah is in the fish's belly, three days and three nights, and then it says, Chronologically, it seems like it was after three days. Yeah. <laughs> That's a long time to be in a fish's stomach and not to daven. I believe we would daven quicker. I imagine. 
I, there's not much else you can do in, uh, in the fish, I think, never having been there. But let's go on to the prayer, okay? Let's go on to the prayer. I didn't notice this again. What? I didn't know that there was like a female fish. In there. Can so so I mean it's definitely drash. It's not lepshat. Um, you could use dag. You could use daga. Vayomer. So what does he say? Karati mitzara li adonai vayaneni mibeten shol shivati shamata koli tashlicheni mitzula belevav yamim benahar yesoveveni kol mishbarecha vegalecha alai avaru vani amarti nigrashti menegedei necha. Ach osif labit erechal kotshecha, first half of the tefila. Let me go for the first half, okay? I'm going to see how the first half and the second half of the tefila are very, they also parallel each other. So the first half of the tefila goes like this. I've called you from, from, from danger, from, uh, from uh, tzara. No, my, my uh, suffering, distress, and you have answered me. From the stomach of hell, I call to you, and you heard my voice. You have thrown me, thrown me into the depths, in the middle of the sea. Water is, uh, rivers are around me. All your waves and your and your uh, whatever. <laughs> all the waves and 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 uh, ripples. ripples and ripples is a good word have uh, have gone on me and i said i am nigrashti i have been sent away how do you say how does it say nigrashti driven from your from before your eyes ah and then, ah, yet I remain seeing your temple, your holy temple. First half. Let's look at the second half. Afafuni ma'im ad nefesh tehom yesoveveni. Water is around me. Suf chavush leroshi. There is uh, reeds of, like, water reeds above my head. Likitzvei harim yarati. I've gone down to the, to the, to the uh, roots of the mountains, right under the water, the roots of the mountains. The, the, the world is locked before me. And you have brought up from the very depths my life, Hashem. As my soul is about to leave, I remember God. And my prayer comes to your holy presence. Again, both sides start with him grasping in the water. They come to a point where he said, that's it, I'm done. And suddenly, he views God. He sees Hechal Kotshecha. That's what it says twice, right? The, the temple of God. Those who hold on to uh, uh, false hopes they leave their 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 uh, they've lost their chesed vani bekol toda is bechalach i with a happy voice or the thankful voice i will bring you sacrifices asher nadarti ashalema that that i vowed for i will pay yeshuata raduna yeshuata is the Salvation. Salvation. I knew the word. I just I had the S. I just forgot. Salvation is before Hashem. There are different perushim saying what in the world is going on with this song. We talked about it when we read it the first time. Why is this his prayer? If I was in a fish, my prayer would be Hashem, save me. That's the only thing I would say. Save me, save me, save me. Or Hashem, I have sinned so badly. I'm sorry. Only two prayers you say. This prayer is telling how I was red, I was in the water, I was drowning, and then, Hashem, you saved me. It's a saved me. You're in a fish, pal. What are you being saved for here? You're, you're, you're in a fish. What kind of saving? So, so there are a couple of perushim. One perush says he wrote this afterwards. This is a prayer he wrote after the fish spit him out, and it's a retro prayer. But that's not common in the Tanakh to write a retro prayer. Another perush is Ibn Ezra brings. This is a prophecy. He, inside the fish, he prophesizes his salvation. And since the flute of prophecy of his salvation, he is... But prayer in the Tanakh is not prophetic. Prophecies are prophecies. Prayers are prayers. Prayers always come 
prayers always come out of tzara. They come out of difficult times. And they're not when it's like, I already know the end of the story because I'm a prophet. I already know, but I'm going to pray anyway because I'm, I'm playing the game. It doesn't work that way. Prayer is prayer. It comes from a hard place throughout the Tanakh. Prayer is always, unless it's praise, but prayer is usually when the person is involved in it and he doesn't know he's going to be saved. The third option that Rashi brings and probably is the more Meduyak one here. So who am I to say what's the more Meduyak? But Rashi says, this prayer was said as he was drowning. There are two stages to this. When he's drowning, he is saying, that's it, I was sure it was the end. I was sure he was about to die. I was sure this is it. And then the fish came and swallowed me. At first glance, the fish swallowing him is like a bad thing. But when you think about it, the fish saves him. The fish sa- he's going to drown. He's in the middle of the ocean. There's nowhere to go from there. The fish saves him. It puts him in jail. He's sort of like in jail in the fish. But who sends the fish? Vayiman Hashem. Hashem sends a great fish to, to, to swallow him. And here comes one of the most important ekronot of Sefer Yonah. Yonah's trying to run away from Hashem. Remember it from the last time we were there. Yonah's trying to run away from Hashem. He, he's trying to stay away from him. He doesn't want to be, right? Milifne Hashem. He wants to stay away. He says, Hashem, I'm willing to... Now, you have to, have to realize the power. I have to emphasize this. The pinnacle of human existence is prophecy. Why do I say the, human, the pinnacle of human pro, uh, existence is prophecy? Because being creatures that are both spiritual and physical... Um, the highest level of connection to Hashem that we can attain is when Hashem appears to us and when Hashem connects to us. On Har Sinai, we were all prophets. And Kriyat Yamsuf, what was so special about Kriyat Yamsuf? Because all of Israel saw on Kriyat Yamsuf what Yechezkel ben Buzi, the prophet, didn't see. It is, it's, it's a major event. Har Sinai, the reason we believe in Hashem, Rabotai, the reason we believe in the Torah is not because Moshe received the Torah. Why is it? Because we all heard the Torah. Because every single person there heard Hashem. Says the Kuzari, says the Rambam, the Mahmad Har Sinai is the ultimate proof of Judaism. It's not philosophical. You could philosophy explain all kinds of things. The reason we believe is because we were there. And it wasn't one person who was there, like other religions, where one person had some event or three people had an event. It was three million people, right? 600,000 men, women, children under the age of 20. Throw out the number. Three million people. They saw it. They heard it. And they told their children, you can't lie with three million people. You just can't. And why was Har Sinai the epitome and the, 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 the highest point of the experience of mankind with Hashem? Because it was, it was prophecy. That's what happened. Everyone experienced Hashem. Prophecy is what we're for. Yonah is a prophet. He got there. He's reached the pinnacle that we all would just hope to get to. And he's, he says, Hashem... I'm throwing it all away for Amisa. I'm, I'm willing to get, throw away all these great madrigot for Amisa. I'm leaving you, Hashem. I'm leaving you, Hashem. Aha. But there's another side to here. It's not just him. Hashem is also playing here. And Hashem says to him, You're, You threw me, but I don't throw you away. Now, it could be on one level, it could be because I have a job for you. But on a deeper level, the statement that I have a job for you is a statement that I believe in you. I believe in you. And therefore, I'm not letting you run away. I'm not letting you commit suicide. I'm not letting you drop out of the game that we're, we're, we have here. You have a job. Yonah. It's for you this job also. 
prophet has no, has no free will in this case. What? The prophet has no free will in this case. <laughs> so, so this is a, a struggle of, of his will, free will, to disconnect from God. Yeah. And you can't disconnect from God because Hashem loves you. And that is possibly the most important message of this book. And it's possibly why we read it on Yom Kippur. In other words, when we come to Hashem on Yom Kippur and we say, Hashem, please, please, please forgive us. Hashem, please, please, please. What we're really saying is, Hashem, please, 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 be believe in us. Hashem, please give me another chance. That's what we say to Hashem. Every, that's what we mean. That's what we say when we say, Modani. When we say, Modani lefanecha, melechai vekayam. What does that mean? Munatecha. Great is your belief. Not Rabbi Emunati. Not Rabbi Emunati. I don't say Hashem, I really have a great belief. It's Rabbi Emunatecha. Your belief in us is so great. You gave me my soul back this morning. That, that's what we say every morning. This is what we say. We say, Hashem, you believe in me. I woke up today because you believe in me. And you said it's worth sending a soul back. It's for another day. And even though sometimes we don't believe in ourselves, and sometimes we feel so far and we feel so covered in sin and so far from Hashem, Hashem believes in us anyway. And Yonah was trying to run away. Hashem says to him, you can't run away, I'm sorry. Sorry, you can't run away. Because I believe in you. And I need you. And I want you. You could try to run away from me, but I'm not going to let you. And so I send a fish to hold on to you. You're trying to, he's like cutting his wrist. He's trying to, he's jumping off of the, the, the noose around his neck. He's trying to kill himself, but it's not working. It's now I throw into the, into the water. Is it? Shem says, no. I'm not willing to let you go. And, and in that sense, if you go back to the, what, what the book is about, the book is about can man disconnect from God? Not on a low level of disconnect. Sins, uh, 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 immorality. That's the usual way to disconnect from God. This is a high level of disconnecting from God. This is an ideological disconnect from God. This is saying, Hashem, no, I'm not willing to do this. But on, on the essence, it's the same thing. Someone who seeks into sin, someone who goes into immorality, into the lower levels, he's also running away from something. As we know, addictions, as we know, uh, bad deeds are very often mixed into a need to tear yourself away from whatever it is, to, 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 to stop the voice that's it's in your inner. Uh, right. Uh -huh. Everything, uh -huh. like all drugs or anything. Are, 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 are running away from something. Yeah. You have to find out what you're running away from. Because what you're running away from, in essence, in, 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 in Jewish thought, is your soul. That's what you're running away from. You're embarrassed. You're ashamed. You're afraid. Whatever all the, the, these wordings are, this is what you're doing, in a sense. And Yom Kippur comes, and Hashem says, forget it all. Forget it all. This is what Yom Kippur is, in, the, in essence. It's saying, hey, I love you no matter what. Hey, hey, I love you inside. Hey, that's why Yom Kippur is so crazy that it's, you bring a, a, kor, a korban and it's all good. We don't usually talk that way, Jews. We say do tshuva. If you did something wrong, you fix it. And on Yom Kippur too, we obviously talk about that language. But there's something about Yom Kippur that is almost Avodah Zarah-like, mystical-like, in that you bring the Kohen Gadol, he brings the Korban, and hop! Because there is, in essence, there is a point that Hashem loves us like a father to a son. There is that connection. There's also a king to an Eved. A king to an Eved, it's all what you do. Right? A king, a king with a slave... 
if the slave does not do well, he is dead. There's no uh, rachamim on that sense. We have a connection with Hashem that is on that level too. And on Rosh Hashanah, when Hashem is the king, that's a little bit of what's happening there on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, we bring him as the king, and we say, Hashem, book is open, judgment, if you're okay, you're okay. How does he judge? He judges through deeds. But Yom Kippur is a deeper day than Rosh Hashanah. On Yom Kippur, it's like a father and a son. Then Hashem says, it's true that I judge you. That happens on Rosh Hashanah. But on Yom Kippur, you're my kid. And no matter how far you're running away from me, you'll still be my kid. You'll still be my son. There's no leaving that relationship. That's the, 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 the power of when Hashem says, B'ni b'chori Israel, you are my firstborn. That is, it goes throughout. We turned in Hoshea, if you remember, we're in the Hoshea, right? And Hashem says, they're my children, right? And Hashem says, Yoshea, the prophet says to Hashem, so go switch them to someone else. You don't understand. That's not my relationship. It's not a king and a slave that I can just sell someone to somewhere else. This is, is, is who I am. These are bottom line stories that are happening here in Yonah Sefer Yonah so when Chazal decided to read it in uh, Yom Kippur they're not just talking about that the people of Ninveh do tshuva so that's important too but they're talking how us like Yonah who are just running away from Hashem all through our lives sometimes days, sometimes weeks sometimes years, sometimes months whatever it is we have times in Tukufot that we're disconnected from Hashem. Hashem says to us, I, I'm, not, I'm not giving up on you. I'm not giving up on you. If we go back to the, to the prayer that we read, that Yonah's prayer, Yonah is drowning. And what does he see? I see Hechal Kotshecha. Right? That's what he sees each time. When I'm about to die, I remember Hashem. My prayer reaches you. At the end of the day, Hashem is there for our prayers. He's there for our prayers. But in the first half it said, I felt nigrashti. What was the word again? Nigrashti in Pasuka. Hey. Nigrashti minegedenecha. Driven from before you. And it turns out, that I still see, the door is still open. <laughs> the, the, the holy temple is still open for me. And I can still come back. So, so this motion, the storyline really of chapter 1 and chapter 2, is Yonah running away. Stage by stage, Tarshish, the boat, the bottom of the boat, the water, the fish, going as far away from God as he can go. And Hashem actually saying to him, you can run, but you can't hide, right? You can run, but I'm not giving up on you. Not like, again, the, the, I, th I think, I, I probably, probably there are people who wrote about this. The, the, Yonah is a Greek tragedy in that sense. In other words, it seems like there's fate happening here. I'm trying to go against my fate. My fate is to go to Ninveh, right? Hashem decreed my fate to go to Ninveh. And I'm running away, and you can't run away. But when you read a Greek tragedy, it sounds that man is futile and he is weak and he's a puppet and he's a, just a pawn in, in the God's games. And that's life. And Manasseh, that's life. Fate. And Manasseh. Whatever it was decreed will happen and that's it. And that is hard. It's a, it's a tough life. It's not a moral life. There's no morality there. It is determinism. And that's the way it is. It, it make, takes man and makes him small. This statement says, Hashem believes in man. Hashem wants man. Hashem loves man. And in that way, He's not giving up on him. In a sense, it's the same thing, right? I'm going to decide what happens to you. I'm going to, 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 to do things that you don't agree with. I'm going to shape things greater than you, make you do things that you didn't want to do. But I hope you understand and could uh, appreciate the difference between an uncaring, 
called uh, God who does these things wantedly without with no uh, ar- arbitrarily because that kacha between a God who says no no I'm not giving up on you and I'm going to make sure you come back so that's what we hear in the first two chapters of Yonah and Yonah recognizes that in his prayer but that's the first two chapters <laughs> now we're going to have to see the next two chapters the next two chapters of Sefer Yonah that Met are going to revisit the first two chapters because we said it's almost the exact same thing. And here we're going to have to see what happens in chapter 3, which is, once again, Yonah meeting up with the nations. Right? Who are the nations he's going to meet in chapter 3? The people of Nineveh. And then, if we see it's a correlation, then chapter 4 is going to be Yonah's recognition, recognition that Hashem still wants him. <coughs> but it's not the same as chapter 2, and chapter 3 is not the same as chapter 1. We're going to have to see what happens there. We're going to have to see Chazal's relationship to the tshuva of Ninveh, which is very, very not Pashut. Um, and, and then in chapter 4, which is the, the, the most trying of the chapters, the hardest of the chapters, we have to see what Yonah learns there. I think when we learn that, and I'm going to stop now, because you know, it's a little early, but we'll stop now anyway, um, because it's, uh, it's a good place to stop before the next two chapters that we'll do, Bezalat Hashem, next week. Um, but we'll see that Yonah's understanding of what Hashem wants from him reconnects to what we talked about, Asher and Zvulu. In other words, what is, the, what is Am Yisrael's tafkid vis-a-vis the Goyim? And, and how that works, and what is Hashem going to do. And I think there may be some interesting chidushim there on how we have to view the world.